Hello and welcome to Spiritual Biology. This is the fourth of five sessions about vitality. And the topic today is communal vitality. By this I mean the energy we get from other people, either directly when we hang out with friends and family or indirectly, such as when we go to a restaurant and feel energized by a good meal but never meet the cook or the people cleaning in the back. You'll hear a lot of background noise during this talk, and that's because there's a group of developmentally challenged adults playing ball outside. I hadn't planned on that, but there they are, and I'm choosing to feel energized rather than irritated by this background noise, and I hope you can understand how this might work. Throughout our lives, we're living in communal contexts always being affected by people around us and also being supported. Think of how many people go into building the structure that you're in right now or who work on the computer systems that enable you to watch a video. So there are people around us, often unseen, helping us enjoy our lives. And this is vitalizing. So you can see how the communal aspects of our lives feed very strongly into the personal sense of zest and aliveness that we take out into the day. And this is similar to what we saw in the case of sexual vitality. It also feeds strongly into our personal zest, our personal enthusiasm. So vitality is an interwoven quality that depends on lots of aspects of our experience. And today we're talking about communal vitality. If you watched the prior video, you know that I told a little story about my professional history where I first began working toward high status careers, trying to interact with lots of people. But then in midlife, I developed serious health problems and kind of got blown off course and ended up gradually becoming more aware of who I am and where my strengths and values really lie. And then began to find myself working more authentically toward a project that means a lot to me and, and, and satisfies me on many levels, and that's the project that you're witnessing now, this spiritual biology. You know, it's tempting to say, well, this is something that I created, but in fact, it isn't. To begin with, it depends on the prior work of other people. I could list many of these, but in particular, I think I've been strongly influenced by Alan Watts. I've listened to a lot of his recorded talks and appreciated the way he could weave together meditation, Zen Buddhism, and also modern science in a way that made it all sound coherent. And anybody that knows much about biology is going to owe a debt to Charles Darwin. There are other less well-known figures, perhaps. Barbara McClintock, I mentioned in the first episode of this series. Pierre Teilhard de Chardin was a Jesuit priest who wrote a lot about how evolution can be part of a spiritual sensibility. And of course, we could go back to Lao Tzu and Christ and the Buddha himself and Aristotle and all of these people influenced me either because I've read a little bit you know, about them and also because they influence the culture at large. And indeed, there are you know, whole libraries filled with books that are relevant. Uh, where I went to medical school, there's a biomedical library uh, with you know, several floors containing volumes all about different aspects of life science and medicine. And that's just one example out of many libraries. And so all these books, of course, nobody can read more than a small fraction of them. And yet they all have an effect because they influence the culture and they influence our general understanding. And along the way, there were many people who didn't write books, but had conversations with those who did. And so they also fed into the project that I now do. Closer to home, there are the people that taught me in college and medical school, therapists that I've seen, family members whom I admire and who helped me develop as a person and shaped my worldview, etc. Even you, by watching this video, are part of this process because if there weren't people that were interested, I would find it hard to do this work. Well, I'd like to move 
further in the direction of communal vitality by actually looking at a different animal altogether, a non-human, and this is a bat. And we're all aware that bats can fly, they have wings, they also locate their insects by a kind of sonar, and you know, they're quite remarkable organisms. We can see them here in this time-lapse photography showing how skilled they are at flying. Any animal that survives as a species has adaptations that make that possible. In the case of the bat, it's things like wings and biosonar and aerial agility. Well, humans are also animals that have survived as a species, and we have our own adaptations that include the ability to make and use tools, a general and adaptable intelligence, and a lot of social agility, where we're able to communicate and work together in remarkable ways. Here we see a group of people cultivating. They're using relatively primitive tools, but it's not fundamentally different than using a computer or anything else. All along, since the earliest days of human history, people have benefited by working together, making and using tools, and applying themselves to survival. We can see a lot of social agility on display by watching these Martha Graham dancers. Of course, there's physical agility too, but what I'm struck by in this context is how well-coordinated their movements are with one another. Of course, they've got music that helps with that, but then the music is part of the coordination. It's part of the communication. They form almost an organism creating this work of art for us. Or we could look at these Chinese women in the army marching with tremendous precision. And as we zoom out, we can see how they're functioning almost like a single organism. They're so well coordinated, so in tune. And this is not uncommon. We see it in sports teams. We see it any time people work together, and especially when they know each other well and have practiced together a lot. We see this kind of resonance with other people in romantic relationships. Over time, two people who live together and love one another become a single organism, so to speak. They know each other so well. They know how they're going to respond. They know each other's needs. They may even begin to look a little alike. And the organism could include a larger group, such as a family, or again, a sports team, or a band even more combative interactions can have a kind of organismic quality that's larger than the individuals who are participating in it. People are able to form these resonant sort of organisms, these groups, because they can communicate. Now, much of the communication is through words, but there's lots of other forms of communication, facial expression, gestures, how much a person sweats, how they touch one another, maybe even how they smell, maybe there are pheromones at play, body language, and so on. And we can study different aspects of our physiology that contribute to our capacity to resonate with others. Things like brain waves and hormones and neurotransmitters and different regions of the brain studied with uh, functional MR, for instance, heart rate variability, you know, pupil diameter, all these things can be investigated and correlated with social resonance. But in spite of that, there's still a fair amount of mystery at play. We don't know all the answers. There may even be channels of communication that science hasn't yet demonstrated or accepted. We don't need to worry about those right now. We instead can focus on something that's pretty well understood and fairly familiar, and that's the phenomenon known as mirror neurons or mirror circuits. So these were discovered in a lab in Italy pretty much by accident. What happened was a researcher was holding an object, let's say it was a banana, and the monkey had electrodes connected to its brain, and the electrodes in the region that the monkey might have activated had it picked up a banana itself became active when the monkey saw the researcher holding this item of desired fruit. It was as if the monkey's consciousness was simulating the experience of holding a banana even though it wasn't holding one itself. So there was this interior experience of banana holding triggered by the viewing of someone else holding 
this object. So this is the basic principle of mirror neurons, and it can be generalized to a lot of situations. For instance, we can see a person in pain and maybe feel a little bit of pain ourselves in the same area. We all perhaps have had an experience where someone slammed their fingers in a door and we flinched and felt you know, some discomfort in our own hands and maybe even grabbed our fingers just as a sense of like sharing that experience. Mirror neurons can play a role in absorbing positive experiences too. So here we bring in another brain and perhaps this person is watching a family, you know, some kids goofing around, mom and dad smiling, everybody having fun. And this can elicit a sense of joy within this person who may not be part of that family, may even be a stranger. And we've all had this experience. In Buddhism, this is called sympathetic joy and it is considered to be very healthy. This is a more technical way of describing something that we know very well, which is empathy, the capacity to feel other people's discomfort simply by virtue of our shared humanity. We could say there's painful empathy when we observe painful circumstances, and there's also joyous empathy when we observe joyous circumstances. So now we've kind of brought in two different ways of talking about experience. I made this point in the first session of this series that we could look at human experience through an objective scientific focus, doing experiments and taking measurements, but we can also describe it more spiritually using subjective experience, uh, emotional descriptions, and so on. Well, these days we're living in a world that's got a lot going on that's painful to observe. And so I think for this purpose, because we want to soothe ourselves and help others, it's probably more useful to use the kind of spiritual, subjective language of empathy. Using that language, we can say that what often happens is that we have our hearts kind of wide open to the hardship of the world, in part because we watch so much of it on our devices. And so we allow in a lot of negativity. And this expands the experience of painful empathy. At the same time, we have a little bit of resistance to really taking in the happier, but often much simpler and smaller joys. So it's pretty easy to feel overwhelmed watching war in another country or worrying about climate change, but it's a little harder to feel like simply smelling a flower could possibly balance those very big issues. And yet, in a certain sense, our nervous system doesn't know the difference. It doesn't know that a war is bigger than a flower. And we could, if we chose, absorb more of the positive aspects, not just flowers, but watching children play or puppies wag their tail or people just holding hands or families having fun in a park and so on. We could take that in. But instead, what we do is we tend to block it out and this diminishes our experience of joyous empathy. The effect of that is that we end up with our hearts chronically swung over in the direction of that painful empathic experience. Now, wouldn't it be nice to switch all this around, balance it out, put up a little more shielding against the negative stuff that's coming at us in our devices and open our doors a little more to the small experiences of joy that are fairly common, but often escape our notice. We could begin to savor the positive, and guard ourselves a little better from the negative. This would lead to a more balanced experience. We could sometimes take in a little bit of the hardship, but then balance it with some remembrance and some experience that's more joyous and positive. This practice is similar to what's described in this best-selling book by Rick Hansen, a neuropsychologist. In Hardwiring Happiness, he gives a lot of advice for how we can learn to savor our positive experiences and release some of our grip to the negative ones. In day-to-day -day life, we encounter people in various situations and some of these are pleasing and some of them are more conflicted and it can be tempting to focus on the negative and forget all the little positive interactions. But it would be healthier if we actually did the opposite 
and savored and actively cultivated memories of the positive situations and downplayed the negative. Another way we can use our powerful minds in service of more happiness and joy and vitality is if we happen to be someone who's relatively isolated or during those times when we feel lonely and we get the sense that everybody else is out there having fun with other people, you know, lots of friends and family, but we're stuck in a little lonely bubble, we can actually call to mind positive experiences, your memories from the past. We could even imagine some happy events or some future possibilities and fill our mentality with a sense of community and support. This is a practice that I actually uh, use fairly often and have for a long time and it truly does work. The idea would be to not just lock into a sense of I'm only going to think positive thoughts, I'm only going to remember times of support, but rather to allow our minds to flow between moments when things get a little tight and dark and we're you know, remembering the hardship or viewing something difficult on our screen and then more open experiences where we're letting in some joy, remembering times of you know, happiness or savoring little moments of brightness in our life, the little butterfly outside the window, etc. We can go back and forth and maintain a sense of balance and vitality in this way. I invite you to follow this video by listening to the guided meditation that accompanies it on the spiritualbiology.org website. There's also a written text of a meditation there. As you meditate, see if you can keep in mind that organic sense of flowing, coalescing, and spreading out such as the murmurating birds. I hope this video has helped elevate your own vitality, and I look forward to offering more along the same lines.